Malo Elele, and welcome to the Polynesian Eyes podcast, where we discuss a variety of topics from culture, history, religion, and everything around the globe through Polynesian Eyes. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, to my understanding, the this I don't know this guy's name, but I know um, he has an interest of following this uh, particular Englishman, William Mariner, um, with his accounts of being in Tonga in the early 1800s, kind of before the time of Christianity kind of getting to Tonga. And um, he expresses his view that this is probably the best written journal of how Tonga society functions, you know, back in the days. And he gives his perspective of how events kind of goes along. So um, it's very interesting. And um, as you and I are Tongans, uh, Tua, I think um, we can also just kind of maybe talk on his thoughts and just kind of share back and forth. So the most detailed, the most intimate documented history about the Tongan people and the Tongan culture and basically the Tongan story is found in the William Mariner story. And the book is called Tonga Islands. And Tonga Islands itself was written by uh, uh, John Martin, who is a writer of books of... What are your thoughts? Do you think it's the most intimate... Uh... Well, here's the here's the thing I was thinking because I did ask um, Dad what was his um, you know and uh, for those who don't know, um, David Tafal is my father. He's written many um, accounts of prehistoric um, Tongan history, and I've asked him, Dad, uh, what's his what was his reference and maybe literature that he kind of preferred, and he he told me he preferred George Basin's account. Yep. Yep. Tonga. And I have also asked uh, another person. Unga is another brother who's pretty well versed in uh, Tongan history also. Why he prefers also J. Uh, George Wason's uh, account because I guess William Mariner, it took a lot. I guess from the time that he left Tonga and was in Europe or in UK, there's been a big gap and there's probably a little little things that are not as accurate. Because remembering those stuff in particular, that's what he's. That was his um, his perspective kind of critique, on that. Yes, critique of um, William Her- um, Mariner's account. But yeah, that's 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 just me from what I've. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that and Unga. Um, mm. My reasoning is William Mariner was a very young man. You know, he mm. was basically really young, and he mm. he was primarily you know, just following around Ulukalala, George Vason, what makes him more unique, and I think a better representation of the Tongan experience is he actually married a Tongan, right? Mm. He, he lived amongst the Tongans in a non-military fashion. Uh, mm. I think in Kauai, he had some land, and he was, like, mm. planting things, because I read I read the George Vason's uh, account. Um. And, and there were people, I guess, you know, like back then, like if you really liked the chief, like if a chief was really successful, you would go and ask them if you they could live under that chief. Eh? So mm. you, so I thought that was interesting because it's not like, oh, I'm all powerful. I keep you. No, you actually had to be successful to attract people into your into your land, into your property. And George Vason was to the point where the 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 the, the, the Tongans were like, hey. Dude, George Vation, he's like planting a lot of stuff. He's been very successful. Hey, mm. Tom, let's go and stay with George Vason. So he mm. married Tongan. He lived in Tonga amongst the people. You know, mm. one of the things that that George Vason was, you know, had I think had a better experience on the overall Tongan experience because he would go to a lot of the funerals and stuff, and then he would say, "Man." A lot of these Tongan traditions look a lot like ancient Israel. Mm. And he names like certain things like 
certain ancient Israel laws, like if you touch somebody who's passed away, like you had to cleanse yourself and you couldn't, they were, you know, and the same thing with the, with the Tongans had mm. similar things like that. And then there's also the story of um, he was out fishing and they were talking about a chief who just passed away. Yeah. Cause you know, obviously, I mean, George Vason came in as a missionary. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So he, 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 yeah. he came in as a missionary but ended up getting married and falling away from Christianity. And then he goes back. Living the going, ancient Tongan religion okay. too. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, not, not necessarily living or believing in the religion, but he, he stopped being a missionary and quote unquote Correct. became a Tongan. Yeah. Correct. So, so he's out fishing with some of the, the commoners that are in living on his land. And uh, a Tongan chief had just passed away. And he noticed when they were out there fishing, that they were talking like like almost like in present tense like like mm. the tongue in chief was still alive and mm. so him kind of indirectly asking you know because he he believed in an afterlife being a christian mm. so he goes hey why are you guys talking about the chief like he's mm. dead he's gone yeah mm. like why are you talking like he's still alive and then the and this is a commoner he like grabs his arm or grabs him and says oh you see this touching the body that is dead but then touches kind of like his heart and says mm. never die and so he realized like oh the tongans the the concept of an afterlife they had in 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 their heart like that was a core belief so when you look at the intricacies of understanding the the, the tongan experience i would mm. lean more towards george vason as well mm. um but you know, William Mariner come provides much more of a political um mm. warfare kind of experience and, and being so young mm. doesn't get, you know, by nature of being that age, he, he's just not doesn't have the full experience, I would say. Um, but he does provide really good, you know, perspective. Yeah. Savage nations or savage, basically primitive nations. And so when he heard William Mariner's story. All the stories that he made up or created, he basically said, there's no way I could have thought this up on my own. He had to have heard William Mariner, William Mariner's experiences and also those of his friends for him to understand what truly a savage nation would be like if all they had was their own government and their own society of their own, right? And so he wrote the book just based on William Mariner's story first. And then he finds out that there's a French translation in Paris of the book. They copied it into French, and then he heard about that. Then he thought he'll come up. I, I didn't really get that. So were there two books written? From what from what this guy's saying, yes. Hmm. And then translated into English from French. I didn't know that either. Yeah, I, it sounds like he's saying the guy who wrote the book, who spoke to William Mariner, found a, a French translation of the book yeah. and then maybe maybe there was an earlier book or, or or account that was recorded and then he came in a second time i don't know well, the second edition which is the oh yeah second i edition. have with the witnesses that were actually with him so the first book was of just him the second one was with him and his three friends all of the same age 15 years old so william mariner a 15 year old kid see 15 years old man yeah Okay. Yeah. And how long was he in Tonga? A few years. I mean, teenager yeah. Yeah. versus a, a fully grown man who marries mm. yeah, is working amongst the people feeding me. Who knows? Maybe had some children. <laughs> yeah. Some George yeah. Basin bloodline in Tonga. We don't know of some but... uh, light skin Tongan around. That's probably... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe from Lava'o <laughs> <laughs> a lot of light-skinned people in Vavau. Yeah, yeah. He probably he's like, oh, I must come from Vavau. Doesn't know he's just uh, George Vation from Kauai. <laughs> educated in England, and these are all English young men. Educated there, and then he went on to become an actual mariner, which was basically a sailor or whatever. And because of his uh, level of education, they put him in the, the the clerk's position he was a clerk on the ship on the port au prince 
The Port-au-Prince was a ship that actually belonged to the French in the 1700s, and the English took it over uh, sometime around there, and then it fell into the hands of basically William Mariner's dad. One of William Mariner's friends, because we've got to remember, all these ki- these guys were kids, right? William Mariner himself was 15. There's uh, guys his age that were getting onto ships and picking up occupations on ships, uh, 16, 17, 18-year-olds. And so... Hey, is uh, Epstein Island exist back then in the... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, going and recruiting uh, 15 year olds to get on a ship and go to uh, Paradise Island somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah. Boy. Will Mariner and three other friends of his, of his age group, jumped on and they became that either a hand or, you know, a clerk. Or, you know, in William Mariner's case, he was a clerk. Because he was educated, he knew how to read, he knew how to write, he knew how to keep record, and that's what his his duty was on the ship. Jeremiah Higgins, basically a hand on it, and he he himself was 15 years old. So we're talking about kids uh, sailing, you know, on the ships, uh, doing, uh, you know, basically being hands. Jeremiah Higgins escaped from Tonga, and we're going to call it escape because when they first got there, they were actually, you know, the, the ship itself. They were all... A lot of them were slaughtered, and the young guys were kept and just distributed into society among different, you know, families, and they became part of that family. But he escaped 13 months prior to William Mariner actually leaving. So William Mariner was there for almost four years, and a year and a half uh, before that, Jeremiah Higgins leave. So William Mariner, 15 until he's 19, eh? Correct. So for four years. And um, that Jeremy Higgins is, I don't, where was he put? Was he just put somewhere in Hot Bay too? I have, I have no idea. I don't know the story behind that Jeremy Higgins he, guy. Mm, mm. So was it in Hot Bay where they did the killing? Yeah. It was? Mm. Ulkalala, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, because he's in Ulkalala, Vavau title guy. Well, yes. Apparently, he he had kind of control of both uh, Hapai and Mavau, from my understanding. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he traveled yes. between. And then, like, mm. um, you know, certain times he'll go to Tongatapu, but he mostly stayed in uh, Hapai and Mavau. We get the, the testimony of Jeremiah Higgins uh, to corroborate uh, William's story. He was actually there two months, two years and 11 months. When, 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 when William Mariner got back to England, Jeremiah Higgins was out on duty on a ship, and then he comes back. So this, we're talking about almost two years later. They get back together, and the interesting thing that he noticed is that they started speaking Tongan to each other. So you have people who are going out and sailing and stuff, and it was just a really interesting uh, a note. That that's what they the language they you know retreated to was that language, and he said that if you were to hear them speaking in the dark, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They spoke Tongan that well, right? John Martin gets who exactly is giving this? Oh, they speak that well in the dark. Apparently, the author, the guy that's gonna compose the story from these two gentlemen just to make sure that their stories cooperate with each other and kind of witness and testify that it's true what he's saying and that between Higgins and Mariner. That's what I'm interpreting as. Mm. Yeah. But I think he's talking about like, oh, they're, they're, they're speaking in Tongan is so good. But I'm like, Shana, you don't even know Tongan, so how are you going to know how good their Tongan is if you're saying, well, in the dark, I can't tell the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's yeah. like me saying two Chinese people speaking and I can say, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good, really good Chinese, And I'm like, dude, I don't even know Chinese. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, great. probably what, what he's trying to express is how confidently they spoke and it, mm. and they're just going back and forth like it's natural mm. for them. And so it was very convincing mm. that they yeah. were actually speaking a language rather than pretending, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think the, the other three guys, right? It was William Mariner, Jeremiah Higgins, and another, another two guys together to show. I didn't realize there was like four of them. 
I thought they all got killed. I thought everybody got killed except for Mariner. Mariner, no, no, no. He's he's correct because from what I've I've read the William Mariner um story and there was uh, quite a few and they were yeah distributed. Um, I just didn't know if it was they were all in hot bite or you know maybe some other just regular families that went around maybe Wabat or somewhere else. But yeah, there was. But they from what I understand, there were young young boys, young men. They were mm. left alive. Okay, his friends basically. So John Martin gets the uh, William Mariner's other three friends to come over to tell their story and corroborate, just to corroborate William Mariner's story. Mariner himself was adopted into the king's uh, house. He was adopted by the king or who, whoever was considered the king in Ha'apai, and his name was uh, Finau Ulukalala, and Finau Ulukalala took Mariner in and put him, him under his youngest wife. Finau Ulukalala's youngest wife became William Mariner's mom in Ha'apai. That's where they lived. That's where, where he, he then became from. The other three guys were passed on into three different families, and they had different occupations. But the, the, the reason why Mar Mariner had such an intimate detail of the Tonga history, the language, the music, the politics, and religion, and everything is because he was instructed under the house of the, the king himself. Now, now th I think it's important just since we were kind of, you know, we're by no means saying that Mariner's experience is not valuable, right? We're mm. just making a comparison, but the George Vason was under the Tuiha Takalaua. One mm. could make the argument in a m more superior, if we're going to go off of, oh, William Mariner was under the Tuiha Apai or, you know, the Tuiha Vau, and that's why his account is, is, is spectacular. But we was like, well, George Vason was under the Tuiha Takalaua, the second highest ranking, just the one just below the Tui Tonga, which yeah. would once again say why George Vason's account is, you know, the preference by some and, by some other people. Yes, and just to add on to that, and was that under the Tui Takalaua Muri Giha Mea? Yeah, the last, the last Tui Takalaua. And they were very good friends, like very close. Like it seems like they were like best friends. Correct. They, they were very caring. They had a very, very, I mean, that's, if I remember correctly, that's how George Vason got that land. Hmm. I think uh, Muriki Haamea gave him that land to, to work on yeah. and, and, and stuff Cultivate, like that. Yeah. And, and, maybe, and married and one no, of his daughters. Oh, wow. I didn't now know that I'm was... thinking about it, it may have been one of Muriki Haamea's. Daughters. daughters that George Vason married, or at least tried to marry him to her. And for the viewers too, you know, just to kind of measure it, a ranking system, the Tui Tonga, Tui Hatagalawa, Tui Kangpolu, and then it's the Tui Hapa and Tui. And it's everybody Hapa. else. Yeah. And it's I mean, everybody those are the three main lines. Yeah. Correct. So with the account of that, it could be a, and we all know the lower you are, the much easier and not as complex of how your role is to function. So yeah, that that's all. I was just gonna say that that the tui mava or tui hapai is much lower than even the tui gong po, exactly. which is considered like the, the last kind of you know of the ranking system in Tonga. And that would be assuming that the tui hapai is right below the Tui Kanuku Polo, that would be still two layers below. Okay? And yeah. that's assuming yeah. that that's, I mean, I don't know how much, how the rankings go below the Tui Kanuku Polo, but if we were to be generous and say, oh yeah, the Tui Ha'apai is right below the Tui Kanuku Polo, well, that's still two layers below Correct. the Tui Ha'apai, and that's being generous. Yeah. So, okay, cool. The kings, you know, we, we consider kings, you know, people who are, you know, ordained and voted for or whatever. But in Tonga, kings were con were only considered that almost self-proclaimed um, through military combat. It wasn't, he was just the king of Hapai Vavau and the, that side of Tonga. But inside, once you get inside, it was somebody else. The main thing about this. Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's kind of what we were going back to. When you're kind of in the chief, when you're below the Tui Tonga, Tui Ha'atakalaua, and Tui Kanukupolu, yeah, that's a, 
That's mm. just terrorist. That's chiefdoms. Eh? Mm. Mm. Yeah. But you inherit the Tu'i Tonga. Eh? The yeah. Tu'i Takalawa. Like those, those are titles that are inherited. If you don't, and, if you yeah. don't have the right to that title by blood, you you don't inherit those. You have to have some kind of claim claim to it. Yeah. And from from my understanding, right, Tu'i Tonga, and it's just another brother from the Tu'i Tonga passed on to the line, the Tu'i Hatagalawa. And it's just another brother from that same kind of line passing on the title to Tu'i Garupo, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's really the same family. It's all the Tu'i Tonga yeah. families just yeah. delegating responsibility to a sibling, you know. Mm -hmm. The Tu'i Tonga says, ah, man, all this political, you know, responsibility and governing, I'm kind of... It's kind of bogging me down from doing what I want. So you give it to the Tuiha Takalaua. Tuiha yeah. Takalaua runs things for a few generations and then he does the same thing that Tuitonga does, right? Like, yeah. you know, I'm going yeah. gonna to create another line to take care of all the, the, the government Political and the response. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Preface of this story is the fact that. Um, because a lot of people ask me, why do you why do you 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 lean so hard on William Mariner's story and the book? Because at this point in time, we are listening to people who are telling stories from 200 years ago, and it goes into almost fictitious, uh, mythological Polynesian stuff like the movie Moana, right? Maui and islands being pulled up by hooks and fish, you know, guts and all this stuff, right? Which is mythological to me, which is cool. It's a good, it's a fun story, but they're all bedtime stories to me. I really think that it's more beneficial for what are your thoughts on the bedtime stories in mythology? And no, I agree with him. I agree with him because um I think a lot of a lot of people do do talk about what is it, the cosmology kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there is a there is there is real stories. You know, of course, they didn't fish up the, the land, right? It's just being, um, it's just navigating and finding new land that no one has inhabited, right? But, um, but uh, yeah, I know, no, I agree. And, um, and that's why I do enjoy these um, accounts because they're just, um, they're just regular people just with a great amount of knowledge and skill. And, um it's the same thing with, you know, with the articles of dad just saying that Tangaloa is not really this some kind of god. It's actually like a title before the Tui Tonga, right? And it was passed passed down. So, so yeah. Same thing with Maui. Maui was in this kind of demigod, but these guys were viewed that way because of the skill and the knowledge these guys had. Maui was just a master navigator. Of finding all the islands, kind of thing. But yeah, that's that's just me, Tua. Yeah, share, share I, I, you know, especially with um, Jordan Peterson, kind of goes into the into the fact that you know when you have these quote unquote like mythological mm. archetype type stories, it it really allow to me it it really allows or gives the opportunity to think a little deeper on the stories, like you're saying. Mm. Yeah, it says Maui pulled up stuff from, you know, with a hook. Mm. But it's like, well, if you just scratch it at the surface, yeah, that's all it'll be. Yeah. But if 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 you don't understand the the concept or the context of it, then yeah, mm. it's, it's just a fairy tale, but it's no different right. than the Bible. You know, yeah. that's what a, an atheist says, Adam and Eve and the the story about Noah and the flood, they'll say the mm. same thing. Oh, those right. are just bedtime stories. Well, if you if you don't understand it, I can see how you can think they're bedtime stories, but they they are probably expressed that way for a reason. And to try and you know, like Jordan Peterson says, you you gotta put a lot of information into a small amount of detail. And so mm. you, th there's a reason why these things are expressed the way they are is number one, it's easy to remember. And number two, it's short. Yeah. And, and so you're trying to dig in. And so I, I understand his, his position. Um, I just think he's undervaluing some of those mythological yeah. stories. Yeah. And because there's truth behind it, those, those, 
those stories. You just have to. It's a what? What's the word that you use? A head yaki, right? In the tongue, and that's yeah. kind of. It's 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 a. There's 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 the story, but there's there's truth behind it. You gotta you just gotta figure it out. It's almost. You yeah, there's a hidden there's a hidden yeah. meaning behind it. Correct. Right? It's, it's it's no different than, and this is also one of the weaknesses of. You know, even for George Basin and even for the average Tongan, even amongst the Tongans, when we look at our history, like Nephi says, you know, if you don't understand the ways of the Jews, you can never understand their prophecies and their records. It seems to be true also of its mythological stories. If you don't understand how the ancient Tongans thought and how they approach yeah. and their culture, you can never understand what those stories mean. Um, and, and, and that's kind of my hesitation. I agree. William Mariner provides a great context. He gives like eyewitness accounts of how things happen, but he doesn't have the rich background and understanding of the culture. He can describe what he's seen, but Correct. to go into the context, into the detail, um, there's weaknesses in his account as well. Right. Every mm. account has a weakness. The mythological yeah. pieces have weaknesses. William Mariner. And so I like to take approaches, try to get the benefits of both sides and kind of yeah. fit them together as, as best as possible. Mm. Good points. Yep. All right. For us to understand what actually happened. And this is what actually happened. So all this talk about and we'll get into the tattooing. We'll get into the polygamy and the plural marriage and families and building of all that throughout the story. But I, I, I lean so hard on William Mariner because this is before a reading and writing was even introduced to Tonga. As a matter of fact, there's an anecdote about um, William Mariner and his friends writing stuff to each other on the beach. And then uh, Fino Kalala and all the people that were with them were. Plural marriage, that's pretty normal back in those days. I don't really have any questions on that. It was pretty normal back in those days. But my thoughts, is, well, my thoughts are, what are your thoughts with them bringing back the tongue and tattoo? Well, first, of course, the, you know, it was not really encouraged, especially the tongue inside of the tattooing. And there, you know, there is trying to be a re, there's like a resurgence of tongue and trying to get the tattoo and. You know, it's kind of restoring going around, it. restoring it, resurgence. They're trying to encourage. So what are your thoughts on that before I show you my thoughts with a tattoo, especially? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my understanding is the tattooing, just like many of our traditional dances and stuff, mm. because of our, our hardcore adoption of Christianity, those things were seen as heathen, right? And kind of based off of idol worship so the drive behind a lot of the reasons why we let go of a lot of those things was because they were heathen you know from the you know the heathen idolatry practice and so that that was the reason why that was kind of driven out with the resurgence of of bringing it back yeah it's i guess it's okay i mean i'm kind of yeah. like all right i mean Just, if it makes them feel tongan if they need to have it then i guess exactly yeah. exactly yeah. It, for me to say, oh, there's no value. I'm sure there's value, but to me is my perspective is there are other things of higher value. Eh? Mm -hmm. There are other things um, of, of higher value, like the, the studying the, 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 the ain't like one of the things that the problem with another potential problem of George Vason and William Mariner's accounts is they're observing Tongan culture or the Tongan government that's in decline. Eh? Mm. It's this is not the Tonga that's at its prime as a civilization. This is Tonga that's in turmoil, mm. right? There's fracturing, there's war internally, there, there is no vast empire anymore that we're traveling and trading, and we have you know, basically governors and a bunch of islands. This is what they're observing is a fragment of what Tonga was. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that could be 
misleading in those in those accounts is if you just look at what they're saying oh you were just a bunch of savages running around yeah. killing each other you know but it's it's really a, a a civilization in decline um now for the tattoos specifically great if you guys want to do tattoos okay yeah. but to me good better best i think there's better things and there are other things that are the best like studying um the political and social structure, you know, the ast astronomical knowledge, the the langis and, and, and doing research there. And just, I think there's just so many other options that I think would are bring more value. But hey, if people are interested in tattoos, and I'm sure there might be some historical things we can learn from there, but not really high on my preference. Maybe it's because we're members of the church. You know, maybe if we were non-members, maybe we would be a little more interested in it. But what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my thoughts are the tattooing. I understand why it was significant in those days when it was practiced. And from my understanding, the tattooing was popular amongst pretty much warriors. Anyone of like high rank, like the Dui Tonga, it was pretty much forbidden for anyone to even touch them so right so yeah. they they didn't they didn't have they didn't have it and i know um in samoa you know high chiefs and you know the highest of the high you know they get it too but i think in tonga society anyone maybe the tui hatagalawa maybe had some but anyone lower than the tui tonga was pretty much any man would would have it i don't know when they would do it or when when would be the time for them to get the the, the tattoo but but yeah and the only thing is i know they've called it they have the name tabaka i think that's the name they kind of use you know what is that that's the name of the tongan way of saying the the tattoo of that's the Samoan name of it like the pe or whatever for the Samoans. it's pe called tabaka for or the song like mickey there's another way of saying it hmm. um the Samoan one but you know and i don't mind hmm. I don't mind somebody trying to like it's almost like you're saying do it like when somebody i don't mind the whole revital but i know that's probably not the word they use even those days but if it's better <laughs> than nothing and it makes them feel feel good tongue in, yeah. even though it's may, maybe if it's even 50 percent, i don't know you know but if you make you know if it helps them to feel more tongue in, then you know i don't mind i don't well, mind it, that. and that's that's the thing that i'm saying like people will come up with something like that for the tattoos, but Go then ahead. they will say that the story about Maui and Tangaloa are just made up stuff. And I'm like, dude, there's a real good chance that whatever you're telling me about the tattoo is made up. There may be more truth in the legend of Maui than there is about whatever it is you're coming up with <laughs> mm. yes. on the other and stuff. Correct. Correct. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts on, on the tattoo. And then the other thing is, I feel like the reason why it like it wasn't encouraged because I think it was the same lines what you're sharing. There's much higher value on more important things, which Tonga has kept, right? And it's still being practiced today. Tattooing, like you, you know, I've been in Samoa and stuff. Anyone can get a tattoo. It's nothing, nothing that special. You can just pay. Uh, to Funga and stuff, and they go through the whole process. You know, last time I asked uh, 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 someone, colleague of mine, I think it cost about four grand New Zealand. Wow, three grand. wow. So it's not cheap. Not cheap. And, you know, I mean, if you're to Funga, um, Tatau anywhere, or that, you know. It's good for you. Uh, tatau, it's good for business. You can make you can make money, and why would you, why would you say no to anyone that's a non-someone that want to have one you know yeah and it's just the same thing that it's just what to the first when we had christianity pretty much when he became the duty of all of Tonga, pretty much it wasn't an encouraged thing because i'm pretty sure he because i feel like he's such a visionary man that he saw this this is something that is not that important to carry on you know? well and and i think the important thing 
I think the thing is to also take into account is, and you bring up a good point. If I'm a tattooist or if I'm an academic, that's a low hanging fruit to promote. Eh? Mm. If, if I don't know the deep richness of the culture, elevating tattooing is a low hanging fruit for an academic to say, oh, this is the great part of the culture. You know, this is the high end and here's my, my paper and my studies because that's a very simple thing to, to, to approach rather than the sophisticated structure of the political and even the social, eh? the social structure with the, the, the tongue and society and, and the richness of the names and the inner, the relationships that is, is a lot more complex. And also there's monetary benefit for the people who are doing tattoos like you're saying four grand mm -hmm. of course i want everybody to feel like that's the biggest part of their culture because why yes you'll come to me and get tattoos you, yes because you, you when once you get somebody emotionally tied to that and that's the that's what they've said that's their priority that this is the most important thing in their culture it makes them feel tonguing or whatever then you're going to do whatever necessary financially to accomplish that yeah i mean yeah, that that would be like saying you come if you were if we were uh three thousand years ahead and we look at America, eh? Of course we're gonna find tattoo parlors everywhere and piercing shops, and it's like, oh my gosh, look at how big part of the culture was. Like this is important. We're like, you have the constitution, eh? You have you have the the the, the structure of the federal government with the um a great With compromise a of, of yes. between the houses. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It, you're going to elevate the tattoo shop, and then you're just not going to... That, that's the kind of the comparison we're trying to make is, yeah, tattoo is, is a big part of American culture. A lot of people are tattooing, but there's much greater aspects of American culture than the tattoos, right? Yeah. There's, there's there's the, the political... Um, the religious founding that's part of America, you know what I mean? The, mm -hmm. the founding fathers, like to me, that is a great, greater representation of America than the fluidity of how many people are getting tattoos nowadays. And that's, that's how I'm kind of seeing it with our cultures. Yes. And just to add one thing that's cool about tattoo, and this is pretty much Polynesia or Tonga's, uh, you know, kind of influence to the world. That's pretty cool that the word the Tao or the Tao pretty much translates or creates the word English of tattoo, which is pretty cool. That's still yeah. being used today. Yeah. You know, tattoo that's our influence in, in from tattoo. a little that, island and stuff that's gone through the whole world and everyone uses tattoo, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Tattoo and taboo are, are two big contributions Correct. to the English language. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So, cool. We'll continue here. We're amazed about right uh, with, with the writing because they were writing in Tongan and, you know, but they, you know, they eventually, uh, everybody was like, they were, they were, they, they, it blew their mind that somebody can communicate something by writing it down in words, Right. That's why I'm so big on the Mariner stories because this is before they could even read or write. So nobody could create a story except through um, oral history. So they're telling. Quick question, Masi. Mm. What are your thoughts on whether or not Tonga ever had a written language? Ooh, I think I've spoke with some people. They said there's a possibility that there was a written language, but to my understanding and from what I have kind of researched on my own, I still haven't found any convincing evidence yet that there was a written language, but yeah, that's, that's just a, my ans a short answer to, to that question. Not yet. I wouldn't say. Mm. That. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> How about you? I, I think that there, there had to be, and I'll give you my position on why there had to be a written language. And it's more of just kind of deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. the, the only way to accumulate knowledge and not lose knowledge, but to accumulate is to have a written record. Right. And so if we really believe that we navigated all these islands, 
mm-hmm. and we we based it off of movement of the stars, movement of the sun, and all these things. And as you're discovering these islands, as you're going about, right? If it's purely oral history, there's no way you can maintain that knowledge. That's the weakness of of oral history is you lose knowledge just because memory alone is not sufficient. So if you don't have a written language, you're already down the road of losing knowledge. Okay. And so in order to continue to add new knowledge at the scale that, quote unquote, the Polynesians and the Tongans were doing in finding hundreds of islands, thousands of miles apart, um, constructing large edifices that, you know, that are square, had some type of understanding of geometry and, and, and those things. I just, man, you had to have had a written language. You have to have had it. And and the reason the reason why we lost all that knowledge is because we lost the the capacity to write and read. And once we lost that, we were in decline. Why was that lost? So I have two questions. One, what or how was it recorded to? Why, if it was such an important thing, why wasn't it not kept up? Like, well, I mean, there's there's a million ways. It's the same reason why the Lamanite lost written language. It's it's the same reason why any any civilization, like like we know, we like the Mayans, they had a written language. What what happened? The Europeans came and burned all the books. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? All the mind. So, so that was lost. There's, there's many ways to explain why it was lost. Let's say that there, there was a rejection of God, right? We, th- there's a real possibility. I mean, especially in the LDS Church, no, we came from the Nephites. Okay, correct. Mm-hmm. So, one option could be, hey, did the did, when they left and they came to to the Pacific, did they not bring records? That one would assume, but at some point, you reject the God your society deteriorates and when it deteriorates you start feuding you have one group that hates another group destroy the other group that that has the capacity to read and write like maybe not everybody and read and wrote but maybe the tangaloas and the maui and the tuitongas did or maybe the tangaloa the tangaloa clan and the maui clan and the priests maybe they were the only ones who read it and wrote and then once they disappear, they disappear with their knowledge. With their knowledge. Maybe, maybe that's the reason why Tangaloa. I mean, I'm we're just theorizing here. Yeah, yeah. We're just maybe talking. that's why the Tui Tonga line was brought in place because why? The Tangaloa line and 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 the re- that's a rejection of type of society where maybe they read and write, I, read and wrote. I don't know. But th- there's a million ways it could have happened. But I I don't know wouldn't know how it how it did um but my, my personal thoughts are there's no way you can accumulate knowledge without a written language and then you have and then you have really old beaches like laulea yeah read the words was it carved in stones or anything or in pictures no, i don't was know like, yeah because i wasn't there something in hot pie that they found of yeah like the carved the in hieroglyphs like stone? With, yeah Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, they had to have something. I don't know. I mean, that's my personal belief. But like you said, there's no scientific evidence. This is just pure yeah. hypothesizing and, and observation. Telling stories and they're passing it down and passing it on. And just like as as we all know, uh, the whole you know, uh, if you look at um, you know those those uh, those stories where people, you know, you, you you tell somebody a story and then they turn around, what you know, the telephone story or whatever that is. And then eventually at the very end, the story changes so much to where. That's the weakness of oral oral history. history. Yeah. See, you're, right. it degrades. The information degrades over time, even when you're trying to repeat it. That's 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 why I would accumulate the decline of the Tongan Empire. It's. The moment you lose reading and writing, you start to decline because you can no longer maintain knowledge. The same reason why Nephi and Lehi had to take the brass plates with them. 
because there's no way they could have remembered all the commandments. That's why they had you have to take a written record with you. If you don't have the written record, you're going backwards at that point, which is what he's explaining right there. Now we believe that the oceans and the you know the, the islands were pulled up by people, and you know, people are come from gods and they fell out of the sky and stuff like that. When really, no, we were all just born. All right. If we're gonna talk about the actual scientific ways of how people are created and islands are created, we know it came out of the earth, lava. You know, science, biology, and so on and so forth. And so before Tonga could even read or write, nobody was was reading or writing. They actually thought it was witchcraft to write and read and write because there were already missionaries from England in Tonga reading and writing, and they felt like because they were communicating that way and nobody else was understanding because we're such a, a, an oral people, they thought that they were committing acts of witchcraft. <laughs> so um, that's uh, uh, another reason why th this his part of history was so important. So when we, when people speak of history and speak of the 1800s and the late 1800s after Christianity showed up in the 30s and after everything happened, now the, the, the people in Tonga and, and pretty much Polynesia are relaying stories that they only heard orally. Nothing was recorded. And I can't, I have yet to find anything that was actually recorded um, as intimately detailed as William Mariner's before anybody could read and write. That's why I lean so hard on Mariner's story, because he's talking about our behavior before anybody else could talk about it. He was there. He was adopted to the to the leader of that uh, island. Uh under the, the youngest wife, and it'll go into the story where uh, the youngest wife will teach the, the culture. She'll teach whatever the, the, the father's house entails. Each mother of that man uh, or each wife of that man will teach each of their children the principles, not only of the culture, but of the house of that man. And because this man was in politics and he was the leader and he was the military guy, uh, Mariner was able to get into the, the details of everything, the religion and on through the culture. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah Higgins, when he got back to England, he went and started working for a man named Mr. T. Woodman, who was an intelligent farmer. Uh, John Martin said that he was very intelligent. He knew what he was talking about, whatever. And Jeremiah Higgins will tell stories about Tonga to uh, Mr. Woodman. And when John Martin ran into Mr. Woodman, he asked Mr. Woodman what Je uh, Jeremiah Higgins told him about Tonga. And you know, the first edition copy okay. of the book of William Mariner's experience to Mr. Woodman, Mr. Woodman read it and told him that's exactly how the story was relayed to him by Jeremiah Higgins himself. Even though Jeremiah Higgins was a quiet guy and really didn't say much or whatever, he did speak often. And there was a lot of people that questioned him because nobody has ran into any experiences like that, even though a lot of them have sailed, they've been to South America or the West Indies or wherever, none of them have actually come across, you know, a story like this. So they'd always question and some would mock and some would, you know, not believe. But when the book came out and people started reading it, anybody who told the story, Mariner, uh, Jeremiah Higgins and his companions, the more people that uh, told those stories, this book basically came out and corroborated all those stories. I mean, what I want to kind of mention here is even the Europeans were ignorant of the reality of the world in other places. It wasn't just the savages in the Pacific who were ignorant. Yeah, we were limited to what we were. But even relaying true stories back in England to people who were quote unquote civilized and were knowledgeable they couldn't, they wouldn't believe the stories that these guys told, right? And they're like mocking them. Oh, what a crazy story. People don't behave like that. You know, it's like George Vason saying, he's like, dude, the Tongans have cultural behavior and traditions that are like the house of Israel. Yeah. yeah. All of Europe would have been like, yeah, that's hilarious. That's the stupidest yeah. thing in the world. But then now in the church, we're like, yeah, it makes sense. They, they're Nephite, yeah. you know, and the Nephites came from. Israel, of course, you would find certain behavior and culture that reflects ancient Israel. Yeah, no, and just to add from from what I've learned too from uh, that is uh, 
the biggest the biggest sign that you know that we had a very close relationship with the people of Israel. Apparently, Tonga, compared to any other ethnic groups, they've already practiced circumcision, which was only a Hebrew thing. Mm -hmm. So, and um, to me, that's that is the biggest evidence of why that that uh, relationship to Israel and why that cultural practice was passed down and even up to Tonga. So, yeah. Yeah, because that's part of the, you know, Abraham's sign of the covenant, right? Was yeah. was circumcision. Interesting. Because they no some some of them weren't even uh, uh, believable, especially the stuff for the wars and but he does mention that they were tattooed like the Tongans were, and that tattoo ran from the belly button basically the belly button to the knee. Nowadays we know we know this and recognize that that tattoo is on you know Samoan people, the Samoan chiefs or the Samoan um, high chiefs or the Samoan speaking chiefs, and that's what they use it for as far as where it's at now. Ever since Christianity showed up to Tonga and Tonga eliminated uh, the tattoo thing because Christianity taught that the body was a temple, Tongans stopped tattooing. Yeah. Even though at that time, 15, 14, 15, 16 year old Mariners said they were all getting tattooed just so that they could mark them as whatever tribe that they're from, they were marking the warriors accordingly. The word tatao itself means similar or looks alike or whatever. That's basically what tatao comes from. And so as the earliest spelling of the word, as far as modern history, tattoo comes from this, his dictionary. He made a dictionary that comes from that dictionary because he spelled it T-A-T-T-O-W, tatao, as best he can pronounce it or announce it, the, the word tattoo. And now we use the word tattoo. Side note. The first time I ever heard that, I was watching Jeopardy. <laughs> and on Jeopardy, Alex Trebek says the word tattoo comes from this small nation in the South Pacific. And I was like, it does? And then when he said, what is Tonga? Then I was like, the word tattoo comes from there? And then I, and once I read this book and realized that he wrote a dictionary back in the early 1800s, then I realized, oh, they're saying tatao, which means the same. Everybody they marked with these markings, they wanted to make sure that they looked alike because the tribes were different. And in order for them to know who they're fighting and who they're going to war with, because all they had was a wrapping of cloth around their waist. Once they went to war, every one thing, one thing I want to mention about that, that mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't think it. I don't I can't remember if it was um William Mariner's account or George Vason's account cuz he's kind of giving the, the 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 picture he's painting the picture here that you were tattooed so that they could know which tribe you came from right yes that's what he's but saying what, with the word tattoo the same yeah. yes but but what I find interesting and I I'm trying I can't remember if it was George Vason or William Mariner is when they would have war between the villages Right, this chief against that chief. And remember, I told you, like, uh -huh. they were like going to different chiefs, kind of dependent on, oh, this chief provides better, whatever. Hey, let's go yeah. live on his land and work for him. When there would be war between these people, be like, oh, people can go in and out before the war starts. Because why? There would be family members. Yeah, yeah. Well, they would change the legions like that. And so there could be family on both sides. Correct. Yeah. So I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure out then if we take this interpretation that all the warriors or all the guys were all tattooed and they were marked because they belong to this clan mm. as a warrior. Well, how do we, how do we fix that with the other account of, whoa, sometimes there were families on both sides and they would give them the opportunity to leave or, mm. or whatever. So they weren't killing their cousins, like if they didn't want to, eh? sometimes they were doing it as like, oh yeah, whether well, my cousin or not, we're gonna, we're gonna go to war. But I remember reading that that was a practice that they would have is, oh, we're gonna let these people go because they don't want to fight each other because they're close relatives. Correct. So Correct. it does. I don't understand how we can make that work. That all these tattoos was just to mark your allegiance to a clan or or a type of warrior. Yeah, and that everybody had it. I mean, it's it's interesting. I don't know how to. No, no, no. And just to add on, uh, to a, from from my understanding too, I think 
this is the the war in uh, Vilata or something that you know when Tupou the first went to um, I think it's Uija, and I guess the daughter or no the wife to the chief in Uija was a daughter of the Tuitonga, and it was or the wife I think it was the daughter and then you know there was a close relationship with the Tuitonga Laufiritonga I believe that you know the two sons there would not fight but after many encouragements that they ended up joining with um Taufahau the first mm -hmm. and having that battle so of course there will yeah of course there's going to be at times that you will still fight your relative there's times that you will still join your relatives but not fight and stuff so i feel like you are re right with that theory of there was a lot of changing sides maybe after this battle you're not going to be in the next battle you know what i mean <laughs> yeah so yeah. with the whole you know when he's saying that if you're gonna have the same tattoo with that to identify yourself from what clan you were going to be because you can always change Gaina because we know you can be related to from all of Hahake or up to all of Tongatapu and then with some relations to to Motu especially like you know if you have a big wider family but yeah that's what I was just thinking with the family yeah so th there's got to be more going on there's got to be more going on there um to kind of figure out what exactly these tattoos were about and what they were actually trying to achieve Maybe it was just the more loyal guys, right? Like I'm 100%. Doesn't matter who we're fighting. I'm 100% with Uruka Alala. Yeah. Tap me up, so everybody could, knows. Yeah, or yeah, it really could be just a skillful person with with weaponry. Like he was just skillful in the bow vai, you know, mm -hmm. or skillful. It could be could be something like that. Or I've heard some other people's accounts of just reaching a certain age of maturity and maybe a certain a certain family within a village that that was their practice of thing of just what really, they were known for yeah known for of getting getting tattooed and you know if any male would want to do it they could get it from this particular family that focus on this skill um because i think we all know that especially in those days each family um really crafted their skill if it's to fishing to cultivate to do masonry or to be um you know tufunga can be even the tufunga for certain ceremonies the bolo bolo or the inas there was lots of people who really that was their thing and they kind of stayed that way and whoever needed to kind of get knowledge or needed a service they would go to their family that's just me but yeah hmm. yeah not 100 percent, 100 percent everybody tied their wrappings up so that the whole tattoo would show from the belly button to the knee so that you would know who was killing who and who you were killing that's what that marking was from so that you all look alike that's out so that's where where that uh, part of the the history i have a little bit of difficulty with that explanation yeah. Because I think fighting it's a, it's and a trying lot more. To kill. Yeah, when we're fighting and we're trying to kill each other, I ain't paying attention to your tattoos, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. killing. And you. I think, and I think he's just my my opinion. Um, you know, I enjoyed this at the Wawa here. At least he's getting an interest uh, in Tongan history. But I think it's a much of a contemporary definition he has no. of a Tao. Yeah, yeah, and, and like you're saying, we by no means are criticizing. We're just kind of, you know. If we were yeah. sitting next to him and he was telling us the story, that's that's the question we would ask. It's mm -hmm. just part of having a conversation where he could be right. Maybe you and I are wrong, but we're just kind of yeah. giving our perspectives of what we think. So we definitely don't want anybody to be like, oh, they're saying he's wrong or terrible. It's like, yeah. no, that's just our opinion. That's his opinion. That's just That's just what we're doing. Everybody throws out their ideas and you can believe and not believe what you want when you hear it. Mm hmm of the tattoo according to mariner uh comes from so there was no difference in the stories as the other uh, as his companions told the stories wherever they told it there was very little uh difference or variations as far as the behaviors of the tongans from the, the mariner's three friends and the book itself corroborated everybody the interesting thing about the tattoos is that the precision 
of the lines or you know the detailed way that they made the tattoos was interesting because it matched what Captain Cook had wrote about it earlier. So Mariner gets to Tonga in 1806, but Captain Cook had already wrote about tattoos in 1777. Like I said about John Martin, he, he used to be a writer of books, a writer of Savage Nations, and it was impressive to him. He couldn't have come up or made anything like this up. So as far as my weight of belief in this book, because it was Mariner and other witnesses, and they told the story, because a lot of the behavior and the mannerisms of the Tongan people are in this book before writing, that's why I rely heavily on it. Modern day Tongans and Polynesians in general will still believe what the stories have been passed on orally, and that's all good and great and all, but I don't think that um, it's, it's beneficial as far as anyone who's seeking truth about the behavior of Polynesia because Mariner was there when Polynesia was still somewhat an empire because he goes to Fiji, he goes to Samoa, he goes to Hawaii, and there's reasons and why uh, those places are the way they are, the, the way those places are. Yeah, and I, I, my, my perspective on that is 100% believe that William Mariner's account is a true, you know, to the best of William Mariner's. We're not doubting that. I, I just, my perspective is this is, this is not the Tongan empire of Aho Eitu's at, reign and in, in the, in the first 10 Tongan at its, peak. Tonga, at its peak. We're, we're, we're looking at an empire that's and deteriorated declined. for hundreds of years, for a couple hundred years. And so, that that's my only my only thought of the highest we can give William Mariner is he accurately describes Tonga in that period of time. Mm -hmm. The Tui Tonga has already deteriorated, right? I mean, he doesn't have full control of Hapai and Vavau. He's he's just you know there's been assassinations of the Tui Tonga. Like the country is in disarray, yeah. right? I mean, there's. There's definitely, yeah, there's the Inasian stuff going on, but th those are just like on its last legs of being kept. You know, everything yeah. is in, in, in disaster mode. Yeah, yeah. No, and then once you get the whole understanding of, like I said, the, the eras of the Tui Tonga, then you will understand that this account, like what you mentioned, is on the decline of the Tui Tonga, like, you know, at its end. But yeah. yeah, they're even named the way they are, and it somehow, some way leads back into evidence of an empire in the South Pacific. And Mariner happens to be at the capital as an adopted son of the king at that time. That'll be the story that I tell here in this book until and, and just to clarify, the king of the empire is the Tuitonga, the king that William Mariner is in at best is three layers below the Tuitonga. And two layers below George Vason, who is yeah. another account. So once again, we're not doubting that William Mariner's experience is authentic and he's expressing mm. things. We're just saying with the right perspective to understand, you know, when he says the king, it's kind of with quote marks, right? Yeah. He's he's the king, which is closer to a chief, a very powerful chief. Mm -hmm. but not one of the three main bloodlines within the Tuitonga family. At the end of the day, the Tuitonga family are the kings, with Correct. the Tuitonga being the highest of those kings. So Correct. just a and perspective does, on that. Yes, yeah. and he does mention that he was self-proclaimed kind of thing, and that was kind of maybe a thing that he self-proclaimed of Tuihapai. Um, so, yeah. It is. It is. Um, the account is is uh, interesting. Like you said, it's good to to know, and we can view um, Mariner of what he saw, and it's pretty cool through his account how he explains like the Kolotau and how um, a lot of the wars kind of happen and stuff. But when you know when you talk about how the society as an ancient Tonga functions, um, it's pretty. I, I George Mason gives much more of an accurate account. One, he's with a higher 
higher authority of a of a person during that time, and two, he's much much older, much more mature to understand and be part of like you know even gone to a, like we said an intimate relationship with a Tongan and really living like a Tongan. So, yep, yeah. Hundred percent, and that's one of the reasons why George Vasin kind of had to feel like he was had to repent of his ways because he felt like he was basically forgetting that he was a Christian. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. was getting absorbed into the society a little too much. Yeah. Until well, next time, we'll see you later, my friends. No, oh, this this is awesome. I mean, I, I'm excited to continue and talk about it and you know we really appreciate I, i'm not aware of his name do you know his name no i don't if i did i would have called him on his name but uh but yeah i've been i I've, I've only started recently watching some of his stuff and i've always had uh questions and stuff and when you were telling me what videos to look at i was kind of thinking this one so yeah pretty cool okay pretty cool. well and i i think yeah i mean he's doing a really good thing Right, he's yeah. putting out content, he's sharing it. I mean, a lot of people are not going to go and read William Mariner's account, so the fact that yeah. he's he's putting that out there is a good thing. Um, yeah, and the thing, you know, the thing is, he's not the first one. I've heard many and young males, young Tongan males, who've read the book and they they like it. So I think it's uh, it's good we kind of go through it and uh, share our perspectives on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm.